I uh, want to thank all of you for coming to the county executive's first State of the County address. Um, <laughs> Happy New Year. And uh, the last time that the uh, MLS quarterly forum was here, uh, we were talking a little bit about the budget and we were talking a little bit about our area baseball team and they had yet to win the World Series at that part, at that point, but um, I think I stood here and said they would, so I just wanna, oh, that's worth applause, not for me, for the night, I mean, come on. And for those of you who might know me, Rich Maddalino, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, but for people who might know me well, you know I'm very pleased to stand here and predict that the Washington Capitals will win the Stanley Cup once again this year. But, but for my family will tell you I say that every year. And, and I'm pleased to say I've only been right once, but at least I've finally been right once. So um, today is an important day for a lot of reasons. Um, it is the, the county executive's opportunity to talk to all of us about the accomplishments of his first year in office and his vision for where we go as a county. But today is also the day that the county executive introduces his 2000, um, his FY21 to 26 capital improvement program, the capital budget for Montgomery County. And earlier today, we, um, the county executive briefed the county council about his plan for our nearly $5 billion comprehensive capital budget. Um, and so we are going to hear a little bit today about the capital budget, but you're gonna hear a lot about his vision. But make sure that you um, spend some time going over the capital budget. I wanna thank um, the great team from the Office of Management and Budget who helped um, pull together the, the budget plan. So our deputy director, Jennifer Bryant, and um, I don't know if she's arrived yet, but Mary Beck, who coordinates the capital budget for us, so maybe you will all have a chance to personally thank Mary um, for the projects you got into the capital budget. So um, it was uh, quite a lift, and as you may know, we do this only every other year in Montgomery County. So. Um, this is the big year for the, the capital budget, and um, the, you're going to hear a lot about that um, over the next few weeks and months. Um, I want to acknowledge some of the people who are here today. Um, we, um, as you may know, there are some exciting things happening in Capitol Hill. So our representatives um, from the area uh, in Congress are not with us, but we have multiple representatives here from our uh, fantastic congressional delegation. Joan Kleinman is here representing Montgomery County's own U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen. <laughs> Kathleen Connor, who's the district director for Congressman Jamie Raskin, is here. And Vicki Garcia, who's the community outreach specialist for Congressman John Sarbanes, is here back there. And um, I don't know if there's anyone representing Congressman Trone um, here today. So um, today is also a, a legislative session in Annapolis. So many of our legislators, all of our legislators are in session because they actually start at 10 o'clock in the morning. So unfortunately, we don't have representatives from the, the General Assembly. Um, last year was a year of transition. I think we've talked about this before. It is the first transition in 12 years in county government. And when you're thinking about stability, it's only the second transition in 24 years in Montgomery County. So um, we all appreciate the extra effort. Everyone in this room, our, our residents, our volunteers, our community leaders have put into making this year a success and helping out with the transition, helping us deal with the change, helping us bring new ideas to the fore. Um, sometimes we forget how much we've accomplished in just a short year and how many different people are impacted by it. So we've prepared a short video where you will get a chance to hear not from um, elected officials as much as the regular community members about your impact on their lives over the last year. 
Hello, this is County Executive Mark Elrich, and I want to thank each of you for allowing me to serve you. I am proud of the work we've done in my first year as County Executive. The Council passed and I signed an historic racial equity and social justice bill, and we've already begun to invest in early childhood education. We have listened to and visited businesses all over the county, and through our For Business initiative, we have already improved our procurement process and opened small business assistance centers. We have over 150 volunteers working with us to develop a plan to address the urgency of climate change here in Montgomery County. We are working on multiple ways to improve our transportation options and also to address affordable housing. We also have maintained our AAA bond rating, receiving strong positive comments from the bond rating agencies. We have and we will continue to work hard to improve the quality of life for all people in this county. This is part of a circle, the Silver Spring Circle, which surrounds downtown Silver Spring. There are more and more people who are living and moving into Silver Spring who uh, want to do most of their transportation or a lot of their transportation by walking and bicycling. And when there aren't proper facilities to separate bicyclists, pedestrians, and motorists, then serious crashes can happen. And so this helps separate the different users. We must recognize and respect the work of our county's early childhood educators. We cannot build a system without them. A robust birth to five early care and education system integrates neuroscience and best practices to support each child's growth and development. A thriving system will ensure choice and access for families through a mixed delivery system that recognizes the true cost of quality early childhood education. So building a high quality birth to five early care and education system will require visionary leadership, collaborative cooperation, and a courageous investment. It's gratifying to be a part of this effort and thank you for your commitment to early childhood education. And I wanna give a special thank you to the county executive and council president because you really have shown that you're early care and education champions. I really want to thank County Executive Mark Elridge for his tireless um, advocacy for renters' rights. I remember when this legislation um, was being considered and no one thought that it could pass. It was stalled but I was then a board member. I wasn't in the state house then, and I just remember um, the county council member at the time just being tireless and relentless in his efforts to pursue this legislation, and look where we are now. So thank you so much, Mr. County Executive. Uh, first of all, we as a contract, we'd just like to thank the, the county executive and, and the council members for their foresight in instituting this Green Bank. Uh, we walk through a lot of buildings every day, and we really understand the magnitude of efficiency gains that can be achieved in this county. Uh, it's a tremendous amount, uh, but we need financing programs in place in order to make that happen. And so when the Green Bank, uh, when we first started with the working groups, uh, we, we took an active role in participating in those and helping Tom and the team uh, formulate and, and strategize on some of the programs that would really have a good uptake in our community and the contractor community. I say, you know, the old war horses like myself that have been around forever, you know, just take a look at these people. They're coming in with such good ideas and and you know they want to make a change and they want us to deliver excellent services to the county and they're thinking of ways to do this that um, you know are cost neutral or no cost at all it's a good thing all the way all around and I don't see why anybody wouldn't want to be part of it it's just so great well I think the department's moving in a very good direction the leadership was great uh, the address was wonderful uh, I wasn't expecting it but I thought it was uh, wonderful I think it, we're in good hands Montgomery County is open for business for manufacturing. Not only is it a wonderful place to live with terrific schools, great education for higher ed, uh, great other kinds of businesses, but for manufacturing in particular, this is a wonderful place to be. I want to thank you specifically, uh, the County Executive, Mark Elrich. I think, I think you've been a great leader, especially for business, for, for all sorts of things in the county, but for business in particular, it's very clear that this is important to you. And we are, we are more than happy to be at the center of any type of development from the business side, from the entrepreneurial side, and especially from the tech side. I think um, what we bring, there's not a lot of 
Bay Area companies that are now located in Silver Spring. And to the extent that you can use us to help get the word out that this is a great place, we would love to do that to the extent that we can use this space for tech events and other stuff. We're happy to do that too. Um, but thank you all so much for your support and for being here today. And we really look forward to what happens after today. Thank you. I'm an immigrant. I'm a coach. I'm a teacher. I'm a father. And I'm also a community organizer. It'll be a day God that made today to have this executive order signed by the great man behind. And all big guy here to make sure our fear. Two weeks ago, when this order came in to you know, start the 10 people, we have a training of our family, stay home because they cannot come to the practice. Because parents say, coach, we don't know if you will get out, what's gonna happen. But I believe from today, I can have them on the practice from tomorrow, and that the life on their house can continue and be bright. For those of you who don't know, Mark Elrich is a native of this region. He was born in the district, but raised here in Montgomery County. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland. Um, he has called Tacoma Park his home for much of his adult life. He spent 19 years on the Tacoma Park City Council. He spent 12 years as a member of the County Council. He is Montgomery County's seventh county executive. I've had a chance to know him for 20 years through a variety of roles. I think Montgomery County has a tradition of electing really amazing people um, to lead our community, whether it's in Congress, at the state level, or at the county level. And certainly, Mark is no district, uh, different. For those of us who have had a chance to spend time with him, he likes to talk. He likes to dig into the issues. Um, he really wants to know what is happening, why. He has a big heart. He is concerned about the people of our county and making it a better place to raise a family, to start a business, to grow old and retire. We are fortunate to have him as our county executive at this moment in time. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce our county executive, Mark Elrich. I'd add to that that it's really an honor to have Rich working me for this administration. Um, Maryland's mistake is Montgomery County's win. And uh, he's just a bright and innovative person. And he brings ideas. He looks around. If he knows what I'm looking for, he's out there. He's probably as obsessed with the internet as I am. <laughs> we, are, we are curious people, and I, and I really do appreciate working with him. And I was partly raised in the district, so I won't say I was entirely raised in Montgomery County. I stayed in the district till I was 10 years old, so my first f four years of school uh, were in the district. And, uh, but I do consider myself a Washington native. The other you know, good thing for Richie, you can talk about the Caps and uh, the Nationals here, because if you had been governor, that would have been tough. You, know, you might have been obligated to talk about Baltimore. but. <laughs> Um, anyway, I just want to you know, thank everybody for coming out here today. Um, I don't uh, know that I've, well, I haven't done a State of the County address before, and I, you know, hopefully you'll get a better picture of where the county's going when I'm done. I want to thank uh, the council members who are here, Sydney Katz, Evan Glass, Tom Hucker, Darren Collard's here from Montgomery College. Um, these are all people who are partners um, in, in moving things forward. And, uh, and I especially want to thank our employees. Um, you've been instrumental in helping my administration make this transition. And it is a transition because it's you know, a slightly different agenda, it's uh, different people, and it's a hard thing to do, particularly when you don't get much practice because you only do it twice in 24 years. Um, it's a change and I think people have just been wonderful. Um, and you all remind me of something my father said one of the better things he said when I was growing up, um, when he was trying to teach me about the importance of workers, he would say that you could put a pile of gold in front of the mouth of a coal mine and not a block of coals coming out of that mine. 
Nothing gets done until people go to work. And it's people who make things happen. It's people who create value. It's people who create change. And I've been informed by that my whole life. And my experience in the county, both as a council member and now as an executive, is that you are the people who make change and make a difference. And so the for the employees who are here and those who are back on their jobs, I know we couldn't fit 8,000 or 10,000 people in here. Um, I just want to say thank you. And I want you to know how much I appreciate what you've done and what you've been able to do to help make a difference in the county. Our county is fortunate to have this talented workforce and I really do appreciate your commitment. I've already acknowledged the council members. Boy, did I go off script. <laughs> I'm not used to this teleprompter thing. <laughs> um, but I want to thank the council for their partnership. And we got through some really big things last year and we were able to make steps, take steps that helped to make the county a more equitable and inclusive place. And as leaders, we often talk about, how, about our diversity and how it makes our county special. But last year, we truly embraced our diversity and stood together on two major actions. One was the Promoting Community Trust Executive Order, which is something we talked, at with, we talked about with folks on the council and in the community before we put it out there. If there's a signature of what Montgomery County is, building community trust is a huge part of that signature. The second thing is um, passing the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. Nancy and I started working on this uh, back when I was still on the council, and there are few jurisdictions in the country that have done this. It requires not just policy changes, but it requires introspection. And it requires us not just to make sure that we check the right boxes, but it, makes, it requires us to make sure that, that the people who work for us have the kind of understanding of the diversity of cultures and people who are in Montgomery County so that we make the right decisions and it's more than just checking a box. I think we sent a message to the region and the world Montgomery County has been and will continue to be a welcoming place for all. I also want to welcome and thank the municipal leaders throughout the county. People sometimes forget that Montgomery County has 21 municipalities that works to deliver services to the people who live in our towns and cities. I live in Tacoma Park. I was a Tacoma Park Council member for 19 years, so I know what that means firsthand. So I want to thank the leaders for their work to make the county a better place. I want to thank the state legislators who are busy in Annapolis right now. We had a good year last year. Um, we worked very closely with them. We were able to stay as a team, and I'm going to be spending a lot of time down there. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but I want to thank them for ensuring that Montgomery County gets the resources that we need, and uh, they're a big part of making sure that we have the kind of quality of life that we need here. And I think with their leadership, uh, we should have another successful legislative session. And I want to thank the congressional leaders who represent us so well in Washington, whether it's the senators or the congressmen, um, they actually come out to Montgomery County and sit down and talk with us. And they ask us what our priorities are and what they can do for us at the federal level. And I appreciate that because sometimes you just think that's a different world and we're in this world and I mean, how do they mix? Well, they really do mix. And funding for transit and schools um, are all things that can be aided by the federal government. So I appreciate what they've done. As I look back on what we accomplished last year, and the challenges we face, I was reminded about how special this county is. While we identify ways to improve, it's important to remember that Montgomery County still is a model that other, holds up, other people hold up as a success. And not just here in Maryland, but around the country. We have a strong education system. We have a highly educated workforce, and we have residents who are engaged. We have government programs and services that are among the best, we have a diverse population that few communities can match and which bring a diversity of language and skills here which are valuable in a growing global economy. And people from all around the world want to live here. And that makes us stronger. We have wonderful neighborhoods and great parks and recreational facilities. People from all over the region come to Montgomery County for our festivals, our fairs, arts and entertainment, dining and retail. And I'm still glad people are coming here for retail and not doing all their shopping on the internet. Um, and we are the economic engine of the state of Maryland. Make no mistake about that. From our northern part of the county to the southeast neighborhoods, there's no doubt 
that we continue to offer great opportunities and a great quality of life. So we have a lot to be proud of, but not everyone is doing well in Montgomery County. Our prosperity is not evenly distributed. So in the years to come, our challenge is to sustain and improve our quality of life while growing our economy in a more equitable and inclusive way. Everyone has to be able to share what's good about Montgomery County. And we need to make sure, as part of our mission, that we get that done. We cannot afford to be complacent. We have to move forward to build a better future where all are included. And everyone is seated at the same table as equals. These goals need to play a central role in informing what we do. And those goals have been a large part of what you're going to see included in our budget. Over the last year, we have begun to important, important issues that will move the county forward. And you know, I've talked about seven priority areas, so I'll just tell you what they are again. Uh, one is thriving youth and families. How do we make sure the children and their families um, continue to prosper and be successful in Montgomery County? And how do we help those who are not prospering and are not successful? We need to grow the economy. You cannot continue to do more things. If you look at the, the things folks have put on the table for the county to do, without growing the economy, you don't get the resources to be able to do those things. So I'm fully aware that we have a responsibility to grow the economy as part of the work we're doing. We need a greener county. We are part of a global crisis, and we need to do our part to make sure this county becomes greener. The previous council set very high objectives for us to meet, and we intend to meet them. We need a county with easier commutes. I just drove down George Avenue this morning coming here. That, that was a treat. <laughs> um, at least the excuse was they were doing major repair, repair work to the road, but I could have easily been bottled up on George Avenue if I was coming in about an hour earlier. And so I know we need to do a better job of moving people. And we need to be a more affordable and welcoming county for a lifetime. Um, and this implies to, you know, both, you know, seniors and folks at the beginning of their adult lives in Montgomery County. We need to help seniors be able to age in place. And we need to help young people find housing in Montgomery County. And we have to think about, you know, to me, one of the most frightening statistics that we deal with is there are 20,000 households in Montgomery County today who are earning $30,000 or less, they are paying, these are not people who are on the voucher system. So these people are paying 50 to 60% of their income for housing. That means you're paying $1,600, $1,500 out of your, a month out of your $30,000 income just to stay in Montgomery County. That's an enormous lift and we need to do a better job dealing with that. We need safe neighborhoods, and we need an effective and sustainable government. And I've put a lot of interest on making the government more efficient, because when the federal government's not raining dollars on you, and the state's not raining dollars on you, and you're not raising a whole bunch of money um, because our growth is slower than it should be, and when you've got the Robin Ficker tax trap, laid on top of us, which has severely limited our ability to raise revenues in no context with the needs we have, then there's a lot you've got to do. And we're prepared to do it. But I want to remind you of some of the things we accomplished last year. We launched the Early Child Care Initiative together with then Council President Nancy Navarro to provide more access to pre-K education and to help improve um, kindergarten readiness. We strengthened our code enforcement through inspection of troubled apartment buildings and around, around the county and created one of the most aggressive enforcement programs in the region to ensure that people have safe and affordable housing. Um, I was, thank you. Uh, I was deeply troubled at the kind of problems that were uncovered, you know, and it wasn't just the explosion at the apartments at Flower Ranch. It was going into the apartment complex after the explosion and realizing how far we had allowed that to decline. And you can blame the landlords all you want, but we have an inspection department. If they had ever gone in 
and been directed to inspect, to find, and to require that these things get fixed up, we wouldn't have been in this mess in the first place. And the problem is deeper, thank you, the problem is deeper than just that corridor. You can go all around the county and find apartment buildings that aren't, weren't properly maintained. So we did a surge, we're not done. Um, we're gonna continue to stay on this until we bring the apartments in the county up to where they belong to be and we're gonna keep them there. Uh, we are well aware of our reputation regarding business. And it's not a good reputation. You know, when people tell me that um, if they located a business or one of their friends wanted to locate a business, they'd pick someplace else. Um, that was troubling. And I heard this every place I went during the campaign. And uh, Sydney Katz and I talked about this. We also talked about in the context of the minimum wage that if we were going to require more, we had an obligation to look at some of the burdens we put on business and make sure that what we require are things we should require and we don't require things and we don't have processes that are overly complicated and overly expensive. And so we're determined to change that reputation for the better. I want Montgomery County residents telling other Montgomery County residents to open your business here, not in Frederick, not in Arlington, not in the district, but here in Montgomery County. To that end, we visited and met with hundreds of business owners throughout the county, large and small, to learn about how we can improve the county's business climate, we wanted to learn more about what's happening and how we can, and in order to improve our business climate, we launched our four business initiative. We listened to small business owners so we could find ways to eliminate the unnecessary regulation and bureaucracy. We opened small business resource centers in Germantown, Silver Spring, and the East County, and we'll soon be opening additional centers in Bethesda and Wheaton. Uh, we reformed our procurement process making it more transparent and user-friendly. It includes a solicitation tracker. For years, people would say, I have no idea where my contract is. Where's my contract? No one's talked to me. But now, you can go online, check the status of any solicitation throughout the process, any solicitation. So if you're interested in who we're doing business with and what those contracts look like, you can actually see that now. Additionally, in the very first four business forum, a local business owner complained about the size of a landscaping contract that he was bidding on. And he had over 150 pages to review. And in order to do that review, we talked about probably needing a lawyer and needing an accountant to evaluate what was being asked of him. And so a lot of people, and he wasn't the only one, he said, I don't even bother to bid on county contracts. It's too hard. The profits are too small given you know, the size of these small contracts. I can't afford the lawyers and the accountants to tell me whether or not I should even bid. So in the same week, the Office of Procurement created a paragraph summary view of the contracts. It provided a link that allowed vendors to view the scope of the solicitation in just 10 pages. That's a big deal. I want to thank. One of the best dressed people in my administration, Ash Shetty's over there, and uh, he's a breath of fresh air, and uh, we are, you're gonna see real changes in Montgomery County procurement. The days of a closed bidding process and uh, contracts just always seeming to wind up in the same hands, those days are done. Um, it's no longer gonna matter what you know no one's going to say again that, well, I asked why I didn't get the contract, and somebody asked me, you need to know people. here. You don't need to know anybody. All you got to do is submit a legitimate bid with references that are substantiated, with a bid that we can look at and say this bid makes sense, and then you bid. That's all it should take to do business here. We've also proposed a new 10% procurement preference for local businesses, because I want more Montgomery County companies to grow and contribute to our economy. And frankly, I got tired of county residents telling me they should set up shop in another close by county because that other county had business preferences. And so they could bid there and were protected. They could still bid in Montgomery County, though they didn't think they ever had a shot of getting a contract, and they weren't protected. So we're going to make sure that our businesses get the protection they deserve so they can bid here and have better chances of getting contracts. And if other jurisdictions want to mutually disarm, we can mutually disarm. 
But if our folks are going to be at a disadvantage someplace else, we're going to make sure that they're advantaged in Montgomery County. So hopefully this will bring about more business for local people, and we think it's important. Our preference actually includes paying a little, being willing to pay a little bit more for local contracts. And why are we going to pay more for local contracts? Because every dollar I give to a Montgomery County company is probably staying in Montgomery County. They're paying rent here. They're supporting property taxes here. I'm collecting their income taxes. I'm conducting their personal property taxes. So I get a lot back. This county benefits when businesses are here and growing. So why wouldn't I give some preference in the selection of a contract if I know that I'm going to get money on the back end back to the county? So this is important. And these kind of changes we think will make a difference along with our aggressive recruitment of other companies to come to Montgomery County. We've begun to tackle the emergency that is climate change. And uh, we assembled five climate, cha climate action technical work groups. And you know, in the beginning, there were people who wanted us just to hire a consultant. Well, consultants have done major reports around the country, and the stuff that's in the other cities is pretty much the stuff's in, stuff in this city or this county, but there are differences in Montgomery County, and we were able to put together these work groups made up of volunteers, um, county residents, most of them, who have time and expertise to work on that. We got people from the EPA and other groups who normally would be engaged with the federal government that had an interest in climate change, except they don't happen to work for one now, and so they're volunteering for us. And so we've been able to pull the energy and expertise out of people in our community they have put together recommendations, and you, we will be coming forward with a set of recommendations um, within the next, hopefully, the next few months. And we're going to go down the road to addressing the issues of climate change. And for people who think that if this is not going to be a top-down process, dealing with clean water was top-down. You wouldn't have it today if the government didn't require companies to deal with it. Clean air, you wouldn't have it today if government hadn't stepped up and said, you have to do it. The idea that businesses all by themselves, large industrial corporations, are going to deal with climate change all by themselves, you'll wait a very long time. You're, the poles will be melted before anybody moves on that. Um, sometimes when the government takes the lead, it's the right thing to do. But I will say, in every one of the other examples where government led, whether it's cleaner cars, cleaner water, cleaner air, they actually generated industries and businesses that produced jobs and income for people. And oh, by the way, the economy did not collapse. You know, auto manufacturing didn't flee the United States. So there's a value in what we do. We are going to be leaders in this. We cannot meet our climate goals without a concerted push for transit also that gets people out of the cars. That work is underway. In just a few months, you're going to see flash bus service on Route 29. Um, I will say it was supposed to be called BRT, but until they put it in dedicated lanes so it's truly bus rapid transit, I told them, you have to give it a different name because I don't want anybody looking at that and saying, and that's what you mean by BRT? Because it's not what I mean by BRT. So the name's going to fit what the project is. But we're looking at dedicated lanes. When all the lanes are dedicated, we'll change the name. But we've also completed preliminary design on 355 and Veers Mill Road BRT lines. And I'm very encouraged by that. We have uh, 16 bidders on the 355 project. And so we're excited that folks in the pri private sector responded to our solicitation. And there are a lot of people who are going to offer us ideas on how to build this project. And we also launched this Flex on Demand tra Transit Pilot Service. And we're doing it in Wheaton and Rockville right now. <clears throat> it's an interesting process where you actually can call Flex and have a bus pick you up at the nearest corner to your house and take you within a two mile radius of the metro stations. Um, I think it has enormous potential for the neighborhoods around metro stations because if we could get small buses into neighborhoods, and people knew they could call and say, I need to be on a bus at 8.10 and know that bus is going to be there. I think we begin to get more people out of the close-in neighborhoods around the metro to start using this. And so hopefully the pilot pans out and we expand it to all the areas around our metro stations. So I'm proud of much of the things that we've done and much of the success can be 
attributed to, I think, to our focus on trying to make government more effective and innovative. And I've posed a fundamental question to managers and workers alike. And I've been very blunt about this, and I've asked people to imagine that you're walking into this workplace, and this is a new business we're standing up. And you're part of the first team that's going to set this business up. And I want you to ask yourself, how should we structure this new enterprise to achieve the goals we want? Because I guarantee you, if you were starting over today, you would not create our institutions the way they're created now. We've got, we've got processes that are 20 years old. We've got job descriptions that are possibly older than that. We have not fully implemented technologies. We're hamstrung between the job description doesn't fit the technology available. We need to change that. So my goal is to redesign the machinery and not simply replace the cogs in the machine. It is time to do that. It, it goes to, the, to one of the hearts of our financial issues, that if we ran this place better, we'd have more resources to spend on things. I am not you know, out here saying we want to do tax cuts, because I've got too many needs to be talking about tax cuts. But I know that I've got resources tied up in places that we can liberate them. And our first obligation to everybody, and particularly our taxpayers, is to let them know that we've liberated every dollar we can liberate from things that are inefficient and ineffective. And then if we need more, we can talk about needing more. But people need to know that this government's committed to using their dollars in the best possible way. That's the first conversation, and that's where we're starting. I want to you know, acknowledge our Chief Administrative Officer, Andrew Klein, and he's focusing on ensuring that employees at all levels are involved in finding new ways to improve how we just deliver services and programs to the people we serve. We call it Turn the Curve. It's about getting to the root cause of a problem and finding solutions. And as we rethink how government works, we're partnering with our unions. They are as vested in this as anybody else is. I mean, there's this notion out there that somehow they will run, you know, you hear this all the time, the unions will run the place into the ground. You do realize that if they did that, they would actually have no jobs. It is not in their interest to blow the place up. It is in their interest to make sure that this place works right. And so we're going to partner with them. And one of the things we're doing, and I want to thank Michael Baskin for this, so that we're, um, because we see them as key stakeholders in what we're trying to institute, we're going to collaborate them. So my favorite Turn the Curve initiative is our innovative Innovation Accelerator course, where employees learn about business process improvement and how to get better results without spending more money. The changes are simple, but they're profound. I went to the graduations of the first two classes of the innovation course, and it was inspiring. I mean, I was really excited. It was amazing to be in a room where people had these their projects displayed around the room, and they were talking about, this was a problem in my department. We, you know, we thought about how could we make this better? How could we save money? How could we save time? And they've put these pro projects out there, and we're going to be implementing this stuff. Because this is, the, this is the intelligence and inspiration of people who do these jobs every day. And when asked, could you do it better? They're like, yeah, we can do it better. And so we've got a third cohort coming up. It's oversubscribed. So there's a waiting list to take these classes. We're going to make these available to our workforce. And I'm confident that we're, at the end of the day, we're going to transition our workforce. It's going to be a more productive, a more thoughtful, and, and frankly, a more engaged workforce because they're going to know that what they say matters. And if they have ideas, they're not going to be told we're not interested. They're going to be told we're very interested. And it confirmed my belief that we don't automatically need to bring in consultants to tell us how to reorganize. I always think of that, I guess, is it the office or the movie where you know, they bring in the consultants who have no clue, and they're like firing all these people. And it's just like, yeah, you can do that. It's easy to shrink the workforce. You just you know, go down the tables and execute every third person, and they're gone. But that's not a way to make the institution survive. And I've got to say, for too long, when we had budget crises, we just lopped the workers. And so you lost the people who delivered the services 
which didn't make us more efficient, didn't make us better, it just means we delivered less services. So we're taking a different approach to this. Um, we have people here who know these jobs better than anyone and they can help us find ways to work better, more efficiently and save money. And it's an opportunity for people to regain satisfaction from the work that they're doing. And that's an important component of people being successful in their job. They've got to feel like not only are they appreciated, but that they're contributing value, that they're just not going in and signing the same form or punching the same button every day, but that their presence is actually valued by the people who work around them. So our innovation accelerators are working and they've got more than 100 projects already across departments. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Eric Bergman in DOT came up with a way to respond more quickly to residents uh, who had questions about tree maintenance and to free up more time for arborists to inspect trees. Kendra Yoakum in the corrections designed the process change to get inmates referred to services basically as soon as they hit the jail, which aims to improve their success rates when they re-enter the community. And this is big, but I've got to say, there aren't many places where you would hold up your jail as an example of one of the best institutions that you have and probably one of the best institutions in the county. But this is at least one jail where the, the focus is on rehabilitation and re-entry. And not everybody does that, but we're serious about it. And I just want to give a shout out to that department. I, I'm glad I can say that our jail focuses on rehabilitation and re-entry because I visited somebody in Towson jail and no out there or exercise area, no training, no counseling, no nothing to make sure these people did something other than go out, do the same thing again, and then return to jail again. So I've seen the difference right here in the state of Maryland, and we, we do amazing things. Um, Grace Denno is in the procurement department, and uh, she's helping small businesses get registered to compete for county contracts by eliminating duplicative steps and making the process more clear. In addition to encouraging innovation, we've been fiscally focused. Last year, we submitted a budget that achieves the county's reserve targets and begins to address budget deficiencies that have been ongoing. Um, our work and focus on the county's physical health earned us another year with a AAA bond rating, and it was gratifying when Standard and Poor's evaluation found the county to have strong financial management and policies. And they said, and I quote, the county continues to see significant economic development that should aid in tax base growth. And that's from Standard & Poor's. Earlier today, I presented the council a six-year capital budget. And as we developed the capital budget, we found ourselves facing uh, the common problem of having many more worthy budget requests that exceed available funds. I spent 12 years on the council. This is an annual process what departments need and legitimately need exceeds the resources that are available. And so we have to make tough decisions. And what we did is we tried to stay true to our values and focus on issues that residents asked us to address in the county's 2019 residents survey. It was a very interesting survey. I'm pleased to say that despite limited resources, my first full CIP budget will invest in many of the priorities I mentioned earlier education, affordable housing, transportation, early childhood education, and the environment and economic development and infrastructure. There's no question we would have liked to have fund more, funded more. But with every budget, limited resources require difficult decisions. This year was no different than any other. However, we have some great initiatives to report. I want to give you some of the highlights of this budget. First, this capital budget that I'm recommending has $4.2 billion over the next six years. This amount stays within the council's approved spending affordability guidelines for general obligation bond borrowings. It leverages significant non-county resources and recognizes the constrained revenues that we're dealing with. Uh, I want to add to that that, you know, we're not just looking at revenues, but we're asking people to think about how we're doing some contracting differently. And a quick example is we've, this, we've got the school system looking at the possibility of going to electric buses, and the company that made the proposal said we can pay for this over the next 10 years by what you were planning to spend on buses anyway. Now, that 
is harder than it sounds since electric buses cost three times as much as the buses we were buying. But due to the miracle of tax law and tax credits, um, there are ways for people to operate a business and take the tax credits and, and everything that comes from both depreciation and solar and electric vehicles, and that helps bring down the price of the buses to the jurisdictions that are buying them. And if I can get those buses paid for by what we were going to spend anyway and take savings out of our operating, that frees up money to do other things. So that's another avenue we're pursuing with a whole variety of things that the county does. For education projects, I'm recommending a capital budget of a little over $1.7 billion for MCPS. Their share will grow to over 40% of the capital budget. It's the largest share of the capital budget, and it's over 94% of the Board of Education's requested amount. These funds will be used for construction, renovations of elementary, middle, and high schools, and provide ongoing investments in MCPS roofs, HVAC systems, security enhancements, outdoor play spaces, other infrastructure. These funds do not include anticipated state aid increases because we don't have those numbers yet. And we know that the governor and the General Assembly have both said they're going to prioritize supporting the counties in additional capital spending. So we believe we'll get more money when we know what the state's giving us. We'll plug that into these numbers. Hopefully it'll be enough money over six years that we can fulfill everything the school system wanted to build. If it's enough money, we may even be able to accelerate some things in the schedule, but we won't know that until we see what money we actually have. Um, so this support from the state is actually crucial to fully fund uh, the school system CIP of, um, request. That's one of the reasons I'm gonna spend a lot of time at Annapolis. We've gotta make sure not only they give us the aid, but they've gotta give it to us in a way that we can actually use it. Uh, there's a match process that we need to make sure that the match works for Montgomery County, and this is an issue for other jurisdictions around the state. So hopefully, we'll be sure this is gonna come out well for us. Our capital funding for Montgomery College will fully fund the college-wide physical education renovation project. It supports increases for the Ike and Catherine Leggett Math and Science Center. That's scheduled to open in the fall of 2022 on the Tacoma Park campus. And along with other infrastructure investments, um, this funding should be pretty significant. These enhancements are on all three campuses. Um, includes the student support and STEM facilities also at the Germantown campus. Last year we launched an early child care initiative and it was meant to improve kindergarten readiness around the county, which includes funding for an early childhood center at Watkins Mill High School. So I'm recommending funding in the capital budget to renovate the county's existing child care facilities in addition to that and to ensure that they're ADA compliant, compliant and we replace um, dilapidated beyond their useful life modular facilities with new facilities. Um, if you know me, you know that schools are dear to me and early childhood education is important to me. I was a fifth grade school teacher, fourth and fifth grade. I spent 17 years in MCPS before I got elected to the council. And I taught at Rolling Terrace, which was what we call the high impact school. And impact refers to poverty. It also refers to language differences. And kids who come to school who are hungry, who are ill housed, who don't get adequate access to health care, whose parents struggle for money, they struggle in school. So I, this is not a theoretical thing to me. This is real classroom experience. This is seeing kids hungry, and then you wonder why they're crying instead of doing their work. Well, hunger will do that to you. So what we do with the schools is important. Being ready is important. You know, the statistic in the county is that half the kids entering kindergarten are two years behind, and I keep reminding people, two years behind at five years old I mean, we're, I think most of us in the room have been parents. I think we know the difference between five and three. That's a significant difference. And what's, what really gets missing is language acquisition skills, um, the ability to understand, to have a vocabulary that lets you understand what's being read to you and being talked about. 
We can do that with early childhood education. This is something we can fix. And the evidence out there says if you tackle this early, you get lifetime benefits. Interventions in the later years have far less benefit than interventions in the early years. So we're going to focus on this. We want all our kids ready for kindergarten when they get to kindergarten, because if I can start them level, I can keep them level. And that ought to be the goal of our educational system. It's certainly one of my goals. As I stated earlier, affordable housing is on the top of my priorities, and it's, it's vital for the county's future success. So we have to maintain and expand our stock of affordable housing. And we're taking this critical issue head on in the capital budget. That's why I'm recommending we add $132 million for affordable housing to the capital budget over the next six years. This is not an insignificant investment. It's a record level of funding for affordable housing projects for our capital budget. These funds will be used by the Affordable Housing Acquisition and Preservation Project to facilitate efforts to preserve existing housing stock and increase the number of affordable housing units in the county. Preserving the existing stock is the most cost-effective way of dealing with affordable housing. And if we continue to let it evaporate, and Rob Goldman, you know, years ago threw out a number that the county lost 35,000 affordable housing units since 2000, and that was probably back in 2012 or something like that. Uh, we can't continue to do that. There was, an Ar I think, an Ar article about Arlington where other than things that had hard protections on them, they lost all of their affordable housing in a short span. We can't afford to do that. If, if you do not protect what you have today, you'll never build enough housing to replace it. You don't have the dollars to build it to replace it. I can count. You can count. If it costs, if it's costing a hundred, well, not a hundred, it's costing two or three hundred dollars to build housing. If you're doing high rises where the costs are four hundred dollars a square foot, you're not going to build very much affordable housing. We've got units. They may need renovation. They may be older units, but renovating them and keeping them. In the, affordable, in the supply of affordable housing is the most effective thing we can do. It's not the only thing we're going to do, but we're going to do that and we're going to focus on expanding it. This capital budget also includes a new affordable housing opportunity fund to leverage funding from other partners that will support short-term financing while affordable housing developers arrange for permanent financing. We believe we can leverage our money four to one we're putting in 10 million this year, another 10 million next year. Also by next year, we should be able to leverage $100 million or have a total of $100 million. And what this does is, you know, people have come to us and said, we'd like to get a hold of this apartment complex. We're not sure how we're going to fund it. And before we can figure out or they can figure out a funding mechanism for the long term, that project has been sold and off the market. We need to be more nimble, and this is going to get us a tool where when projects become available, we're going to have the opportunity to step and say, we want that building, and we'll be able to work with nonprofits to, to give them enough time to line up financing that makes it possible to hold the units in the long term. So that's one of the things that we're going to be really focused on. I really want to thank uh, Frank and Asim, who've done amazing work in the housing department. I brought you here because of your expertise. Um, you have really strengthened what we can do. You're, both your past experiences, and Asim was um, the real estate guy in Fairfax County. Um, they do things that we don't do and haven't done, and it's just been a breath of fresh air to have people come in and say, you know, there are other ways to do things, um, and it's really good having these guys on board, so thank you very much, and thank you for this very innovative proposal. So we really need this tool so we can act quickly enough to secure the housing that we want to preserve. With this new Housing Opportunity Fund, there will be $20 million, as I said, and we will have leverage. This is going to be a big deal for the county. We believe there are private partners out there. Um, we're not experimenting. This is a track that other people have gone down. And so I think that you're going to be very pleased with the results, and I'm really happy to have this new tool um, in the department. Um, Montgomery County has to be a leader in the quest for more affordable housing in this region. We do. I recognize that. 
we need strategies that are effective and that actually let us get as many units as possible. So I'm driven uh, not just to say how much money I spent, but the more important thing is how many units that you preserve and create. I can spend a lot of money and not get very much, or I can try to figure out how do I spend the money in a way that we, that we do this. I have always fought for affordable housing and policy and against policies that erode the supply of affordable housing. And I promise you I'm going to continue to fight proposals that reduce the amount of affordable housing in the county. And I'm going to continue to work to protect renters' rights. Um, I will be in Annapolis this year supporting the latest attempt at getting a just cause eviction bill um, through the legislature. <laughs> Tenants should not have to worry about being evicted because they called the housing department and asked for an inspection. Last time I checked, that's not a crime. That's a right. And we're going to make sure that um, people have that right. So we're going to continue to work to get that legislation passed until it's passed. I want to thank Janelle Wilkins for, you know, for her continued leadership. Um, she's been dogging about this, and I appreciate it. Um, related to the issue of affordable housing is the issue of homelessness. Uh, Montgomery County successfully has essentially ended veterans' homelessness and chronic homelessness, and we're close to ending family homelessness. And we've adopted a strategy, and there's a I guess a press conference earlier in the week, oh, last week, I forget what week I'm in. It's really easy where I am right now to forget what week I'm in. Um, and the, the strategy is to end homeless, homelessness by 2023 so that no one has to sleep out on the streets. I have been bothered since I've been on the council that county policy has been that it's okay to sleep on the streets eight or nine months a year. We take you, we've got emergency shelter when it's cold, Good luck when it's not cold. That's no way for a civilized society to treat people. And to me, the bigger thing is that if we get people housed, we could actually help them. It's hard to help somebody who's in the woods, who's hiding in the shadows of buildings, who doesn't want to be seen, who can't get themselves clean, um, who can't get to work. It's a lot easier if someone has housing and if we have resources near that housing so that when they wake up in the morning and they go out, there's somebody there to say, can I help you today? Can I talk to you today? And I think we can do that. I know this is an ambitious goal, but we need ambitious goals to motivate us to rethink the status quo. And this status quo is not acceptable. Um, Transportation is a huge issue. We all know that traffic is getting worse. Today's experience could be explained, but, <laughs> but it still goes on. And this isn't news to anyone. I've been a longtime advocate for mass transit. Uh, I think it's almost 12 years ago I proposed the county build a network of bus rapid transit. Why did I do it? I wanted us to get ahead of Northern Virginia because this whole region was plagued by transit problems. So here we are 12 years later, they built the Silver Line, every Northern Virginia county has one or more BRTs they either have in place or are working on, and we're still waiting to get our first quasi-BRT line built. We could have won this race. I wanted to be first, and now we're going to be last, but I don't want to be pathetically last. So <laughs> I, want to, I, want to get, <laughs> I want to get this stuff moving, and in order to attract the most riders possible, mass transit has to get people where they want to go as quickly as possible. We have to work aggressively to de develop transit options that increase both commuting speed and reliability. It's not, also not helpful to have buses bunch up, no matter how fast they're going. If two buses arrive at the same time when I need them to be eight minutes apart, this isn't going to make people happy either. So we need a system that's fast and efficient. That's why this summer the County Council joined me in adding funds for preliminary engineering on Veers Mill Road and the Maryland 355 BRT routes. And we're now evaluating proposals, as, as I said, to build the BRT on 355. And that's going to run from Clarksburg to Bethesda. Uh, we're, trying, we're working with the state to marry that with a road project that would add a, th a fifth lane to Wisconsin Avenue from Montgomery Village Avenue to Clarksburg so that there are three lanes coming out of Clarksburg in the morning and three lanes going into Clarksburg in the evening, which will help beat down the horrible congestion 
that is 355 going north into Clarksburg. And it eliminates the place where inexplicably the road actually goes down to two lanes total. Um, that's just mind-boggling, to empty a town of 45,000 people out with a two-lane road. So we're going to try to deal with this, and the state's working on it. Um, the, a key component of this is identifying non-county funding. So while the BRTs are being designed to move people more quickly through our congested corridors and also improving environmental outcomes, in order to make sure this happens, we're recommending additions to the CIP to complete the engineering studies. We've also included the funding for system development and planning costs for New Hampshire Avenue and the North Bethesda Transit Wave. Both of them have important uses. I, I am very interested in, in New Hampshire Avenue particularly because ferrying everybody from the east side of the county to the Silver Spring Station is nice, but being able to make a left turn on New Hampshire Avenue to take you to Fort Totten where you can get buses to, or trains to two different parts of DC is nicer. Because um, if your trip is to DC, this is actually a time saver to get you to Fort Totten first. So this is a big deal. We're going to move forward on that. We're developing a financing plan and we're looking to, we're investigating other non county sources of funding. I was so happy to be in a meeting with transportation staff where they actually had a plan. And they actually talked about things that other jurisdictions had done and talked about resources that we had not been talking about. It is a game changer because we can do this, but we have to be willing to look at all the ways it's possible to do it. And our, we had blinders on and blinders are off and we're looking at you know what it takes to get these projects done. So we'll be talking to the council and to the public this spring about financing options. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about pedestrian safety and bike safety because this is a major priority. We have far too many fatalities, far too many fatalities that are the result of people being hit by moving vehicles. Um, it's not acceptable. You know, we got the state to lower the speed limits in our urban areas. We got them to go down to 25 miles per hour. That's not enough. People continue to ignore pedestrians, um, people make unwise street crossing choices as well. Um, we need everybody to be more cognizant of, of their behavior. But for drivers, it's the most important of all because you're driving a 3,000 pound vehicle. And if you make a mistake and plow into some, somebody, consequences are often fatal. And we can do better than what we're doing. So. Um, our goal is to get to, you know, we have this Vision Zero goal. I always feel uncomfortable saying that because it's been a real struggle to even make progress. But we've got to do, we've got to make progress. And one thing I'm very interested in is looking at some of the things the district is doing with um, posts around intersections to square off the intersections with force people to make uh, slower turns and more deliberate turns rather than just sliding around our nicely curved intersections. Uh, to accomplish all this, our CIP includes over $266 million for projects that directly relate to the county's Vision Zero initiative to reduce death and serious injuries by 2030. We're going to look for ways to make our intersections safer, and hopefully looking at what they're doing in the district will be one of the things that we consider here. Uh, we owe it to the people who walk, and we owe it to the cyclists. Um, to have a good environment where you can feel safe getting wrong, around. There's no point in talking about a livable, walkable community if it's really not livable and walkable. Uh, so we're determined to do this, and I think um, if we get this funding in place, and I'm sure the council will support this, this is one of those places where like, there's like zero difference of opinion. Uh, so I expect we should be able to make progress on the funding this year. In addition to investing in transit, we're also investing in ways to make the county greener. Uh, my CIP includes funding for energy savings in county buildings and streets, environmental upgrades of the Goody landfill, which is long overdue for replacement, and continued progress in improving stormwater management. And in this fiscal year, the county is going to complete a project to convert the county's 25,000 streetlights to LED lamps. And the money and energy we're going to save is about $900,000 in annual utility savings 
and there's additional labor savings because the lights last far lo longer than existing bulbs, and so there's going to be labor saved in having to maintain that system. As we create a 21st century economy for the county, we're going to build on sectors like our growing biotech industry, which is ranked number four in the nation, but there are people all around the world and in this country who don't even know we're here. And we need to make sure that our, along with our IT and cyber sectors, uh, that people do know we're here. Uh, we're going to look to build partnerships with NIH and with university research programs to strengthen our biotech cl cluster and to increase that visibility. We are the only biotech cluster not anchored by a research university. Everybody else has got a major uni research university there. We are looking because we think that's an important component for here and we think also our partnership with NIH is critical. We can, we can offer things to them. We've got an amazing science community here. I, I get stunned every time I go out and talk to these folks because they really are curing cancer, curing AIDS, and altering the health outcomes for all of us. And we're all lucky to be alive now because uh, what's coming down the road is going to be game changing. And uh, I, I just am awed by the work these people do. This summer, we're going to look forward to the completion of the Wheaton Redevelopment Project. We expect this to bring new economic energy and activity to downtown Wheaton. These will be thousands of people who will eat lunch there and go shopping there, and hopefully this will be a big boost. We're also investing extensively in FiberNet and Ultra Montgomery to make sure the county remains technologically ready to serve as a business research and innovation center. FiberNet provides important improved connections to the region's data centers, which are across the river, and they handled 90% of the East Coast internet traffic, so we're going to have high speed, we have high speed connections into that network now. FiberNet also adds conduit and fiber networks, and we're going to have them in the White Oak Science Gateway, and we're going to increase connectivity to regional networks in Maryland to ensure that Montgomery County has robust and reliable and resilient broadband. I'm recommending $145 million over six years to support transit-oriented development in the Reed, White, Oak, White Flint Redevelopment Initiative in the East County. Uh, we're investing $49 million in the White Oak Redevelopment Project, and we're working with our development partner to promote further development on the site and adjacent communities. We're also exploring the possibility of a kitchen incubator, and I'll actually be touring the potential site in the next week. And we've begun discussions with Montgomery County about increasing access to higher education and career training opportunities in the eastern part of the county. We've got three campuses. I hope that the result of this work and working with the state that we can get a fourth campus on the east side of the county. We've got a ton of residents over there. Of lots of opportunity, lots of people we can educate, and it would be a great assistance if we can open up a center on the east side of the county. So it's an important priority for me, and we've been working with Dr. Pollard and her staff, because I think everybody recognizes that part of equity means things have to be equitably distributed around the county. Um, these projects, along with the booming construction of Bethesda, are examples of the growth and in our investments, and that'll help generate and, re and revenue and fuel our economy in the years to come. So last week was the beginning of the General Assembly, and I'm going to be very engaged again this year. I was there two to three days a week last year. I plan on being then there two to three days a week this year. It is worth the time to go and talk not just to our legislators, but to other legislators and state staff. And I will say that that despite you know, the governor's and my disagreement about something, or a couple of things, um, his staff has been really good to work with. And their departments are working with our departments. And so I really do appreciate the partnership. And I will say it's good to be able to disagree with people and still partner with people on things where your interests are mutual. So I was, I'm really happy to say that we're still able to do that. And it's important because there are critical issues that will have a significant impact on us. So we have to stay on top of all, all of this. Our number one priority is the Kerwin funding. We have to ensure that new formulas provide Montgomery County with its fair share of state funding and that it adequately addresses the needs of our children. The Kerwin Commission recommendations are game changing. You'll hear people say that it's actually true. 
If the state gets the three to four billion dollars in additional education investments over the next 10 years, we have the ability to change educational outcomes throughout the state. And I am really pleased to see that the legislature is largely in support of moving forward and they have to find the revenues to do it. Um, and we all know that's a tough lift for some people, but I think it's gonna happen. As you heard, our capital budget has significant investments in schools. We're going to work to make sure we get additional funding from the state. Um, I'm confident that we're going, to, we're going to make that progress. Too many of our schools are overcrowded, and they need modernization. And so construction is really paramount. And last year when I was down in Annapolis, I would tell people, I want money for construction. And then I would go to the operating committee and say, and I need money for teachers. Because you can build me classrooms and I don't have teachers, it doesn't do me any good. And if you give me teachers and I don't have classrooms, it doesn't do me any good. So we need both. And so we're working to do that and that's gonna be my priority focus down there. We're also working on transportation issues. Um, we're gonna to fight to get the Quarter Cities Transitway put back in the state's transportation plan. I'm reasonably confident it'll go into the plan. It may not have money, but we need to have it in the plan so we can say it's a joint project. Um, and we're gonna to look to the state to renew its commitment to fund transit projects. And so speaking of transportation, I do want to take a moment to talk about the latest proposal for 495 and I-270. As many of you know, I spoke out pretty strongly against the original plans, and I want to thank Tom Hooker and Sydney for, you know, really outspoken leadership on this. Evan, you were there. Um, this was really important, and this is an example of citizens actually affecting a policy outcome. So last year, last week, the governor and the comptroller offered a revised plan that I think puts a stronger emphasis on public transit. It includes a funding stream for transit projects and a funding stream that we've been told will be bondable. And being able to bond on a funding stream is a big deal. Because if you give me money and I can't bond on it, I don't get the multiplier effect. Um, the governor's proposal starts work at the American Legion Bridge. A year and a month ago, I sat in, in my first probably public address, and I said if the governor were serious, he'd start at the American Legion Bridge, because that was not the plan. And a month later, they said, we're starting at the American Legion Bridge. And it wasn't because he was listening to me, but the truth was, if you do a, if you do a traffic analysis, you go to where the clog is, and you fix the clog, and then you see how it moves, and then you fix the next clog. You don't go to the back of the clog, thinking that somehow the front of the clog will behave differently if I work at the back. So I was really appreciative of the fact they've done this, and we're gonna be working with the state. And I wanna assure people that this, we did not sign off on any project. What we signed off on is a willingness to partner with us to engage our transportation people in the planning of this new project. So we're gonna work with the state to design an option from the bridge to I-270 that does not impact residential communities. I am as concerned about residential communities along I-270 as I am along the Beltway. They're all county residents and negative impacts need to be avoided. And we're gonna encourage the state to advance the segment from I-370 to Frederick as quickly as possible because if you take a bunch of lanes and then you collapse them at I-370, you're gonna have a god awful traffic jam. And it needs to go all the way up to Frederick. Frederick needs the relief. Their roads are overcrowded coming south in the morning and north. And, you know, the governor is the governor of the whole state. And this is one of those examples of you need a project that deals with all the counties affected by it. So I'll be supporting efforts by Frederick County to make sure this project goes north. And that'll help county residents, too, because once that becomes a traffic jam and if you're bound for Clarksburg, you will not be getting there fast. Um, there are a lot of details to work out, but I think we now have the opportunity to provide congestion relief in a way that's more environmentally sensible and appropriate and supportive of transit. So we're gonna be working with the new leadership in Annapolis, and I'm confident that we're gonna be working with this delegation on all these issues to get the necessary resources and policy changes to close some of the gaps we have in our own budget. And you know, we make a huge contribution to state revenues. I don't have to tell you that. And I want to make sure we get back more of what we can contribute. So, in conclusion, <laughs> yeah. 
So today I'm proposing a future for Montgomery County where, because of our changed business climate, businesses are clamoring to come here. And the businesses located here are growing and prospering. We're talking about a future with more affordable housing for people who are moving here, for people who already live here, and for older people to help them age in place. We need, they don't always want a new house, but what they need help with is, can I get chores done? Can somebody change my light bulb? Can you do minor maintenance? Because if I could get help with that, if I could get a trip to a doctor's office or a grocery store, I can stay in my house. And a lot of people don't want to move, but it becomes harder to do that if you, as you age. And so we can, at very low cost compared to building units, help people stay in the units they already own. We want a future where people are moving around on our sidewalks and streets, on bikes, scooters, cars, their feet, or rapidly tra tra traveling buses, and they're able to make these movements safely. We want a future where our air is cleaner, where we're reusing and not creating more waste. I want a future where our diverse populations feel as welcome and appreciated because we are an equitable and inclusive community. Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, and probably my all-time favorite president. Um, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have little. That means that we provide good paying, paying jobs for people. It means that we can ensure that people have access to quality health care. It means that our schools are strong and educate everyone that our streets are safe, and our neighborhoods are clean, and that we accept the responsibility to fight climate change and to meet our goals to eliminate greenhouse gases. And we can have a county where a person's zip code does not determine their future. If our legacy is anything, We have to move beyond where we are today, where if I know where you're growing up, I can make a pretty good guess of how this is going to turn out. We've got to change that. That is what equity looks like. That is equity. We will get there. So as I can conclude, I want to say that the county is strong today. And I'll work to ensure this county remains strong and gets stronger in the years to come. That's my obligation and my responsibility to you. I intend to carry it out. Thank you all very much for coming here.